Hello there, everybody. It's Dr. Christine Kazmar from The Poop Scoop Show and TheDigestionDoctor.com. And today's guest on The Poop Scoop Show is Yuri Alkame. Yuri is the owner of Total Wellness Consulting, author of Eating for Energy, Transforming Your Life Through Plant-Based Whole Foods. Yuri is not only a registered holistic nutritionist, but he's the current head of strength and conditioning for the men's soccer team at the University of Toronto. He formerly played professional soccer in Canada as well as in France, and now he currently devotes his time to helping thousands of people get in the best shape of their life by eating healthier than ever and to live with incredible health and vitality. I am super excited to have this interview on the Poop Scoop Show with Uriel Kane. Let's dive right in. Okay, so we are here with Yuri Alkame. Uh, welcome to the show, Yuri. How's it going? Thanks for having me, Christine. It's doing, it's doing well. Thank you for uh, being a guest here. And uh, just Absolutely. to remind uh, our listeners, uh, we first met back in 2009 at uh, a marketing event with uh, Yannick Silver. And uh, actually, I don't know if you remember, but it was the, uh, uh, the go-kart racing, the professional go-karts, right? Fun times. Fun and how times. And how we actually met was on the bus being bussed over to the facility, we happened to sit next to each other, as, as fate would have it. And uh, little did I know that you, know you were also into enzyme nutrition and all the things that you do, the great work you do. So that's what kind of started us off in, in being in touch anyways. Mm-hmm. But um, one of the things I wanted to start off by asking you is uh, your interest in the book Diet for a New America by uh, John Robbins, the would-be heir to the throne for the Baskin-Robbins industry. I find it interesting that we have so many things in common. That book, I, you know, in, in your book, Eating for, Raw for, Ener- or Eating for Energy, I found it amazing that uh, you love that book so much. So I know when I first read it, it was probably 1995 or 6-ish. And immediately mm-hmm. after, I mean, immediately after reading that book, um, I became a vegetarian and remained so for nine years. Not any longer, but I still try to avoid... Uh, meat, but tell me what it is that made you really love that book too. Well, it's like you. I read that book a long time ago now, but I think at the time, I was um, I was just going back to school in holistic nutrition. So I had gone through university, studied kinesiology. I was fit, but never really healthy. I had a terrible diet for most of my life. Developed an autoimmune condition as a result of it. So I really had no idea about nutrition. When I went when I went back to school to, stu- uh, to study holistic nutrition, I was exposed to information like the Diet for New America. So I read it. And for the first time ever, I was exposed to the reality of, of what we're doing to our meats, um, you know, what's happening with commercially raised cattle, chicken, all that stuff, mm-hmm. uh, the, whole, the, the, the whole dairy industry, um, and not just from the, uh, the industrial side of things, but also from what, how that's impacting our bodies. So I started to learn about how, for instance, in my case, with an autoimmune condition, dairy was one of the big culprits because I had sensitivities and, and tolerances to it for most of my life without even knowing it. So as I started to read through the book, I was like, wow, this is, you know, it makes a lot of sense. And this is a guy that was supposed to run, you know, like, Baskin and Robbins empire, so exactly, yeah, <laughs> da- right. Dairy being a huge component of ice cream, <laughs> right. uh, so it was very fascinating, um, and so that's that, that kind of it was one of the the initial works that you know got me thinking that you know we've been marketed to so heavily right. from a young age mm-hmm. about we need dairy for strong bones, we need meat for protein, and to this day, I mean, it's one of the most common. Uh, those two issues are probably one of the two biggest issues that I continue to reassure people about. Um, when they're adopting more of a plant-based diet because, you know, it's not to say that you have to forgo meat forever. I mean, I'm not 100%, you know, vegan by any means, but I've definitely cut down my meat consumption over the last couple of years and I've improved the quality of it as well um, as, I, uh, as I've come to the realization of, of what's happening with all that. Absolutely. And, you know, um, it, it's funny because I was going to ask you this question. You kind of already led me that way, which is what do you think? I mean, this is a hard question because there's so many things, but what do you think is the single most um, or the largest deception the American public and the Canadian public are dealing with right now out there in the health industry? What would you say if you really had to give it one thing, which I know is hard, what would you say is the number one? I I would definitely go the milk route, the dairy route, because we have to understand that there's stuff we don't even know – we're not even aware of that's going on. I mean, the National Dairy Council, which is based in the states, is a huge lobbyist at was- within Washington. So, you know, whether it's them, whether it's, I mean, there's lobby groups, there are lobbyists for MSG, like a specific one little additive yeah, that are supporting, you know, various 
uh, various governmental people with millions of dollars. I mean, there's stuff we don't we don't know about that are being these are being these things are being injected into our food supply mm -hmm. because there's a lot of money behind them. So dairy is one of the biggest culprits because there's it's a huge market. And one I, I don't know um, in the states, but in Canada, if you go see a movie that's I guess somewhat targeted to teens, for instance, like Twilight, you will be subjected to probably four very flashy cartoon-like dairy ads before the movie starts. And it's all about how drinking milk makes you big and strong or it sure. makes you like super person or whatever it is, right? So I think that's probably one of the biggest fallacies, especially you, when you understand what, how, how dairy and, and humans are so disconnected. So. Sure. Are you revealing that you've uh, watched the Twilight uh, series, Yuri? You know what? I, I actually enjoyed them. I, uh, I, I have not seen them. I'm, I have to go see them. If you approve, then it, that, that leads me down that road then. <laughs> and it's embarrassing. My wife was obviously, I'm, I'm not going as a single guy. I'm going with my kids. <laughs> but uh, the last one I wasn't too, uh, wasn't too impressed with. So Yeah, okay. Well, that's too bad. That's the last one, isn't it? Hey, exactly. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> I like uh, True Blood. Do you like True Blood? True Blood's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's get into this labor, labor of love of yours, which is Eating for Energy. Uh, this is 359 pages or so of just pure, fantastic content. I absolutely love it. Um, and and the, uh, the preview to our video where I talk about, you know, your, uh, your background and your biography, so to speak, um, one of the things that I love so much is, is you know, you were a professional soccer player uh, for Canada and France, I believe. Any other countries? I mean, that's pretty amazing. Well, I wasn't for those countries, but I played in those countries. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and, and so not only are you a fantastic athlete, but, you know, this book, you were doing things right then, but you weren't feeling like you were uh, maximizing your performance, I guess you could say. So when you already have somebody that's pretty healthy like you were, uh, very, very athletic, burning all kinds of calories like crazy, and for you to write this book, I think it's it's such a, it's just such a good template for others to follow because, you know, you're one of those guys who's just lean and muscular and you're not puffy and inflamed like some of these people think when they're muscular. So I want to just dive into this book, Eating for Energy. It's just amazing. Um, and if I could... How about you contrast the germ theory versus the environment? Because this is one of those uh, deceptions, too, where people think they're going to get sick from germs. Not yeah. the case. So how about you tell us a little bit about that? Okay, so this is something really important for people to understand. So if, um, so I have a two-year-old who's now in Montessori school, so we put him in there. He's never been sick up until he started school. Um, so obviously anyone who has kids would realize, okay, when kids start to get together, they get sick and obviously people share germs and stuff. So we tend to think that, okay, well, it's because they're exposed to germs that we're getting sick. So now we live in this world that is excessively clean where it's antimicrobial, antibacterial, everything. And that's, that's a big, you know, it's just, that's a big issue in and of itself. But here's the thing. Um, the reason why the germ theory doesn't necessarily hold up, and this was developed by Louis Pasteur, who developed pasteurization, and even on his deathbed, he said that the germ is nothing, the environment is everything, because he even realized that germs, sure, they play a role, but there's something other than germs that are probably more important, and that's what's happening inside our body, because if it was only about the germs, then every single person exposed to the same germ, same bacteria, same virus, would all get sick, right? We're all exposed to millions and billions of bacteria all around us all the sure. time. Um, why is it that during flu season, some people get sick and others don't, right? Exactly. If the germ theory was 100% true, then every single person exposed to the same germ would get sick. That doesn't happen. So there's something inside of us, which is what I call our internal environment or our internal terrain, which is more important. And essentially what that means is that if you are healthy internally, then you're able to fortify your defenses or your defenses are stronger to keep off or to keep out the bad stuff from affecting you. Um, so essentially, it's like if you were in, a, in medieval times and you had this castle, and around the castle you have this like brick wall. Well, if your brick wall has all sorts of holes in it and stuff, then the enemies can get in. Mm -hmm. But if you fortify those defenses, then you're able to kind of withstand the the infantry or whatever assault you're under. So we have to st we have to shift the focus from oh doctor I'm sick give me a pill for this germ to what can I do on my own through food which is really the best medicine to boost my internal defense so that I'm, I'm not subject even if there is influenza you know a or you know a herpes simplex virus or whatever it might be I'm immune to it pretty much sure. because I've, I've taken the actions to to build my system against that so uh, in a nutshell that's pretty much what it's all about yeah and like I explained to my patients uh, well said is you know the other thing too is people don't understand that 80 to 90 they're even saying closer to 90 percent of your immune system lives within your gut so clearly we need to make sure that that uh, GI tract of ours is doing what it can, which completely ties into everything that we're eating. So Absolutely. 
Other uh, things I want to discuss with you about your book are um, if you want to go more deep into what you call the um, your eating for energy food spectrum, Yuri. I, I love that and how you're trying to drive alkalinity back into the body. How about you tell our listeners a little bit about that? Yeah, so the reason for alkalinity is, is alkalinity forms the basis of this internal terrain that we're talking about. So um, every fluid in your body requires a different pH. For instance, your stomach requires, uh, it needs to be very acidic, so roughly sure. about a 2.0, mm-hmm. uh, which, so, so in, in that state, it's able to digest protein. Your urine, a little bit more, uh, a little bit less acidic, but not as not as basic as, for instance, your blood. Your blood really is the biggest, largest tissue in the body, mm-hmm. and it needs to be slightly alkaline. It needs to be roughly about 7.35, 7. 7.4, in between 7.35 and 7.45, on a scale of zero to 14. So, for anyone who doesn't know the pH scale, zero is very acidic, 14 is very alkaline, seven is neutral. Our blood needs to be just above neutral in the alkaline area. Now, the reason that's important is because when the blood is alkaline. Our red blood, uh, just as an example, the red blood cells, which carry oxygen to your cells, are able to operate as they're normally supposed to. So they can move around flowing freely. It would be kind of like driving on the highway at 3 a.m. in the morning versus in a state where your blood becomes more acidic, in which case the red blood cells have a charge around them. And when the blood becomes acidic, they lose that charge and they almost kind of, they almost die and they spew their contents into the bloodstream and they end up kind of aggregating together because they don't repel each other anymore. So uh, they're clumping. They, they, yeah. Mm-hmm. So imagine it would be like instead of driving on, on the freeway at three in the morning, now you're driving at five o'clock in rush hour, right? So okay. your, your cells would be individual cars. You're not getting towards, you know, the ultimate destination, which is delivering oxygen and nutrients to your cells. So you become a lot less energetic. Uh, you, you basically, all, all levels of health decrease because your blood is the, the foundation, it's the river of life. Okay. So the importance of alkalinity is about incorporating more foods into your body which leave a alkaline residue or alkaline ash. And all that basically means is there's a, um, an acronym called PRAL, which, is, which stands for Potential Renal Acid Load. And all that is, is it's an equation, which basically means the protein and phosphorus, protein plus phosphorus, minus magnesium, calcium, and potassium. Okay? So the, the result of that is either an acidic or alkaline residue. So basically, let me, let me make sense of this. Meats, dairy, and grains, for the most part, have more protein and phosphorus than they do calcium, magnesium, and potassium. Those are the those are the three big alkalizing minerals. So when you eat, for instance, a steak, you're getting a lot more protein and phosphorus residue than you are those minerals, and therefore it's a more acidic food once metabolized. Green vegetables, as an example, have little protein and little phosphorus in comparison to the huge amounts of calcium, magnesium, and potassium that they give off, and that's why they're more alkaline. So the whole um, the whole idea with the energy eating for energy food spectrum is that we focus on eating more alkaline foods like green vegetables as an example. The second tier under that are the rainbow color vegetables. So that's essentially any other vegetable that has, you know, or, or fruit in most cases, which is red, orange, whatever other color sure. you want. So the idea is to look at how do we get more greens into our body. And one of the things actually a little while ago that I stumbled upon was I was looking at a, an image of the earth. And I noticed that the earth, if you look at it from outer space, you pretty much see blue and green, which I was thinking, I'm like, that's very interesting because if we look at the earth as a, or if we look at ourselves as a microcosm of the earth, we need to be about 65% water and our bodies operate best when we incorporate more greens into our into our body. And I was just thinking, that's, that's an interesting correlation. So um, it, it's one of those things where you really need to experience it. So adding more salads in, green juices, green smoothies. Uh, if you can start to do that on a regular basis, and we've seen this with thousands of our clients now, they've literally doubled their energy in less than a week. Mm-hmm. And in most cases, we had a, we had a five-day eating for energy challenge a little while ago. And on day two, most of our clients were starting to experience tremendous benefits from better energy, better mental clarity, uh, skin improvements on day two. So, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous how important alkalinity is. And when you eat these foods that are higher in alkalinity, you also get higher amounts of phytonutrients, right? You eat more kale, for instance, which is very, very high in indole 3 carbonyl. Okay. Indole 3 carbonyl is a um, very protective factor against reproductive cancers like ovarian, prostates, and breast cancer, right? So you're getting all these amazing phytonutrients that 
you wouldn't get otherwise if you're consuming a lot of meat and grains and processed foods. Yeah, I love that explanation. And, you know, I think people I think people lose the sight that what's going into your mouth gets into your blood. I think people just somehow think that sometimes it just sticks into your stomach, into your intestines, but they don't realize the impact of the small intestine, the absorption ratio, what's what you're con- consuming gets into your blood. And if I'm understanding you, uh, for our listeners to get this, essentially eating things that are dead, like uh, meats and, and dairy and things like that, they're just causing a lot of sluggishness and fatigue, not to mention all the injections of the hormones and things like that, that, you know, we only know, probably even know just a little bit of what they're really doing to us, to our food supply. But also um, talking about chlorophyll and how the sun's energy is getting into the, the plants and so forth, as you talk about in your book, um, tell us a little bit about that and, and just about how, you know, we're, we're getting all that impact of the chlorophyll from greens and things like that through the sun and how that all, how the whole process works. Maybe you can talk yeah. a little bit about that. Yeah, this is pretty amazing that not a lot of, I don't think there's a lot of, there's obviously not that I've come across any scientific studies that have shown this yet, but um, it makes a lot of sense. When you look at chlorophyll, chlorophyll is the pigment in plants that allows them to be green or that we see as green. And it basically absorbs sunlight, and with that sunlight, it goes into a process, uh, the plants produce um, Mm. carbohydrates through photosynthesis. So uh, chlorophyll, it literally traps sunlight. And if we look at all life on this planet, it requires sunlight. Sunlight is the basis of the energy food supply. If we didn't have sun, we wouldn't have plants. And if we didn't have plants, then animals wouldn't need plants and animals wouldn't live and we wouldn't live. So sun is the ultimate source of energy. And plants, green plants with chlorophyll, contain, they, they literally encapsulate that sunlight as energy. And when we eat those plants, we naturally get a boost in energy. That's part, partly because of their, their ability to trap that sunlight. But the cool thing about chlorophyll is that um, so earlier I mentioned we have our red blood cells, and our red blood cells have a compound called hemoglobin, which contain or which hold on to our, uh, our oxygen pretty much to get through our body. Hemoglobin and chlorophyll have the exact, exactly the same molecular structure, exactly 100%. The only difference is what, what's at their core. Chlorophyll contains magnesium. That's why green vegetables are such a great source of magnesium because chlorophyll is, you know, the component, the core is magnesium. And hemoglobin at the core is iron. The, that's the only difference. Sure. So when you consume like, liquid chlorophyll, as an example, or even green vegetables, it's a very natural diffusion from the digestive system into the blood because those molecular structures are so identical. And that's why a lot of times um, when you look at different cleansing protocols, it's always about green juices because mm-hmm. green juices literally, I mean, they just purify the blood. Mm-hmm. Um, it's almost like a direct infusion right into your blood. And it's just, it's incredible. Yeah, and in fact, uh, I want to kind of dive into a few of the 12 superfoods that you talk about in your Eating for Energy book. Um, Without giving all of them away, how about you talk about one or two of them um, that come to mind of the 12 superfoods? The first one, just because it's on my computer screen here, is (laughs) kale. Uh, The kale is, uh, I just mentioned earlier that it has this amazing component called, or this compound called indole-3-carbinol, which is found in pretty much all brassica vegetables, so like cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, broccoli. Um, kale is amazing because it has one of the highest sources of, of vitamins and minerals amongst all vegetables. And uh, obviously this indole 3-carbinol, it's, it's incredibly high in uh, iron, vitamin K, vitamin A, vitamin C, pretty, I mean, you name it, it has it all. And uh, kale, is, it's something that I add into my, my smoothies, my juices. Um, I mean, you can make salads based out of kale. It's, it's tremendous. That's probably one of the, you know, if I was trapped on a deserted island and I just had one <laughs> to take with me, it would probably probably be kale yeah um, mine would be avocados <laughs> yeah avocados okay let's talk about avocados so avocados are another one of the superfoods i talk about and it, avocados are incredible it's it's so amazing that um like programs like weight watchers which i think are great because they help a lot of women a lot of men lose weight um i think that they go wrong a little bit because they focus so much on the quantitative side like the points so for instance like a quarter of an avocado would be three or four yeah. points and you know most people have 29 points in a day. So if you eat one avocado, that's almost almost half your calories yeah. for the day. The thing is that avocados are amazing. Yeah. A little bit higher in calories. They're 90% fat roughly. And of that fat, it's all monounsaturated fat. So it's very, very good for you. Monounsaturated fat is very healthy for the heart. Um, but it's also very... It's also nice for people who are moving away from eating a lot of meats to have something a little bit more substantial. And avocado is one of those foods that... It uh, gives you more of that substance and a little bit more of that satiation if you're eating more of a plant-based diet. It, it's it's fin- like it, there's so many benefits to it. It's incredible. And the ancient Aztecs used to call it the t- 
testicle tree because it has <laughs> their um, their language back in the day has the shape of, of, of testicles too, which is interesting. So it, it has benefits for that as well. My day is complete that we did an interview with the word testicle in it. I love it. <laughs> All right. So um, what I wanted to um, mention now is is when when people are – when they're out there and they're wondering what to eat and they're like you said, the, the Weight Watchers, they're wondering about points and counting this and counting that. Um, I, I'm kind of getting the impression that you're not such a fan of that based upon what you said and I agree with you there. But can people get fat by eating too many avocados or nuts or things that are plant-based? Go ahead and talk a little bit about how that's just not so. Yeah, I, th- I think so. I mean, I, I definitely take a different approach from the dietetic approach, which is really more quantitative. So if you don't want sugar, use aspartame because there's no calories in it. Yeah. <laughs> it's aspect of foods. You know that aspartame is a neurotoxin, so you don't do that. So I, I look at the quality of foods. When I'm looking at a, a product label, I don't really look at the calories. I look at what's in the ingredient list more so. So um, definitely people can go very wrong with eating too many nuts and seeds and too many high-fat foods. I mean, there, it's, there's, I mean, cal- you know, calories are calories. Right? If you're, if you want to lose weight, you can't have four thousand, five thousand calories a day and not exercise. You know, you're gonna pack on the weight. However, um, if you keep things in moderation and you're eating, for instance, half a handful of, of walnuts and almonds a day, you might have one avocado a day. Maybe throw in some olive oil, some coconut oil. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, the, the, the thing we need to understand is that we've, uh, you know, going back to your first question about one of the, the biggest lies we've been all, all been told, I think this fat issue is, is, is just, it's, it's a debauchery because we have to understand that our, our fat, like our cell membranes, we have trillions of cells in our body and around those cells is a cell membrane which is mainly composed of fats, fossil lipids and cholesterol. If we don't have healthy fats, we don't have healthy cell membranes. And now we're starting to see that the cell membrane might even be more important than the cell nucleus, like what's in the center of the cell, like our DNA and stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's because it's like this that brick wall around the castle. Um, if it's not strong, it doesn't really matter. I mean, everything's going to be getting through. So when you eat like omega-3 fatty acids or, or uh, medium chain triglycerides from coconut oil or monounsaturated fats from olive oil or olives or olive oil, now you're starting to fortify your cells, your cell membranes with good quality fats. And we know that they're anti- anti-inflammatory um, and they're, they're so protective for all levels of your health. Yeah. So I think you can definitely go overboard. And I think where, for instance, a lot of people go wrong just in the raw food area, for instance, is that they spend so much time making these elaborate crusts and cakes and pies right. based around cups and cups of nuts <laughs> and seeds dehydrate them so they take the water out and then you're supposed to digest that I mean yeah. that's really tough to digest and very very heavy in, col- in, in calories so um, there are there are right ways to do it and I think there are wrong ways if you focus too much on the heavy amounts of nuts and seeds yeah I completely agree with you there too and but the, the, the simple principle being if you're eating something more from nature and it's more raw state your, your body's going to find that uh, it's satisfied well before you're going to have any kind of satisfaction by eating any kind of bread or toast or pizza or things like that. They're just simply not, um, you know, c- you know, conducive to health inside the body. So, I mean, avocados, like one avocado a day, you're, you're not going to necessarily want to go have two avocados in a row necessarily. Your body just shuts off with any kind of satisfaction on that. So I hear what you're saying too about the nuts with people wanting to be more um, making like a, a pastry or, you know, trying to make it, su- t- trying to sweeten it up a little bit. I can see where you're saying that that could be going too far with a caloric intake of nuts. Um, so back to your book about eating for energy before we wind down here. Um, just want to give the uh, listeners a little bit of a teaser about this book. Uh, in your book, you, we talked about a couple of the superfoods, but there's a superfood, don't say what it is, Yuri. I'm kind of teasing everybody, but the superfood that has cholesterol lowering benefits, similar to statin drugs is talked about here. Uh, there's a tree that was actually protected back in ancient Greece. Uh, there's actually laws against uh, hurt, hurting or harming this tree of any kind. People have to try to guess what that is. By picking up the book, they'll find out. Uh, the, the surprisingly shocking uh, appetite suppressor is noted here. Um, also, you're going to talk to them a little bit about how green leafy veggies um, have a very, very beneficial impact on our, on our body where they are also preventing us from getting migraines. Is a specific green that you talk about with that. Uh, there's a specific leafy green leafy that has 14 times more iron content than red meat. These are just some of the many things that you can pick up pick up if you dive into this book, which I absolutely love. So, uh, any final thoughts, Yuri, for our listeners about why they should pick up your book? Uh, what things you really want them to take away from it? Should they decide to get it? 
yeah, I mean, I, I, I would definitely recommend, obviously, anyone pick it up because it's, it's something that I, I wrote actually in kind of my transition, my health journey that transformed my life, my energy levels, my health. And it's also worked with um, like tens of thousands of people around the world, no matter you know, what, their, what their issue is, whether it's weight loss, whether it's disease prevention, having more energy. And what, what I often say is how you, heal any, how you heal anything is how you heal everything. So I had, an, I had an autoimmune condition. I needed to find a way to kind of get over that. Eating for energy was my solution, mm -hmm. and I realized that eating for energy was also the solution to having more energy, to losing weight, to preventing cancer. Um, so mm -hmm. I realized that over the years is that whether you're looking to prevent heart disease, clear up gout or kidney stones, uh, lose weights, improve your skin, look younger, the approach in most cases is about 95% the same. Uh, there's obviously a couple nuances here and there, but a lot of what we talk about in eating for energy really is about you know, coming back to nature, eating more plant-based foods, eating more of them in the raw state. It's not about becoming a, a fanatical raw foodist, um, but we give you the information, the recipes, the meal plans to help you make uh, whatever level of transition you're ready to make to, to be sustainable in your life so that you can improve your health. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. The body's a self-healing organism. Clearly, good things are going to happen as a result of eating more natural, more raw, more alive, more living, more vitalistic. Your book does so many great things. There's so many recipes inside this book. There's a, there's a, a meal plan for 12 weeks. You give people everything that they need in this book uh, to really change their life. Like you even said, as soon as even within 24 hours, you could see some changes. And that's probably one of the best things I love about being a professional practice with, with, with what I do. And seeing the change in people's faces, you see them come to life again. You know, you see the whites of their eyes start to pop. You see all these things, and people overall, Yuri, with your information, which why invent the uh, reinvent the wheel is the way I look at it. Um, you've got so much information that people need to know, um, and it's not a matter of not only trying to get healthy, but it's knowing to make the right informed choices because we're just being so deceived out there. Um, and so I am really a champion of the work that you do. Um, next to uh, Steve Eisenman, you're my favorite Canuck. Uh, <laughs> and I really want to appreciate you for taking the time. Um, for our listeners out there, uh, if you want to find out more about Yuri El Kame, you could check out his website, Yuri El Kame. That's E-L-K-A-I-M is his last name. I'll have it uh, linked up below. And then also uh, become a fan of his on his Facebook page, which is Yuri El Kame. So... Thank you uh, again, Yuri. I really appreciate it. Uh, this is my first episode of the Poop Scoop Show, which is a show where we're going to be discussing digestion to consume wisdom. And what a better way to kick it off than interviewing you. So I really appreciate you, appreciate you taking the time with us today. Christine, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. We'll talk soon.